Hey guys, um, so I'm gonna do this week's lesson a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to, I'm in a classroom, I have a whiteboard, and I'm going to talk through the Penelope Maddie material. And I thought it might be especially useful to do a little diagramming uh, just to get the uh, some of the views kind of mapped out. Um, so here's a good plan. If you wanna follow along well with this lecture, uh, and this is the usual plan. You should have the reading questions in front of you and also your own responses to those questions. And then by looking at my discussion on the video, uh, you can kind of get a sense of uh, what those answers are and what and what her project is. Okay. All right. So, okay. That's how we will proceed. Um, okay. Now, on the document itself, I give you a lot of background uh, about questions regarding abstract objects. So if you're reading through the reading questions document uh, under background, it says metaphysics is that branch of philosophy that tries to discern what the basic features of reality are. Metaphysical questions include three we've already discussed. Uh, the nature of intelligence, the nature of consciousness, uh, the nature of personhood. These are all questions we've gone through at length. They're metaphysical questions. They're questions about these fundamental categories we use uh, to kind of chop up reality. Okay. Now, another metaphysical question, uh, which is like the broadest topic there is, the study of being and different types of being. Um is questions about abstract objects. So here's the physical world, right? This is the world of space, time, and matter. And hopefully in the video, well, it looks backward. I don't know, because it looks like almost like a mirror image. So let's just do P for physical world. And um, yeah, chairs, zebras, uh, molecules of all types extended in space and time. Maybe reality is greater than that. Maybe besides a physical world, there's a world of what we call abstract objects. Now, an abstract object is a non-physical thing that's mind-independent um, Plato thought numbers were abstract objects. So if you think abstract objects are real, there's these mind independent, non-physical things out there. Um, that's often called Platonism after Plato. So let's say you're a Platonist about numbers. All right. So you might think there's this realm of mathematical facts and truths and numbers, such as two plus two equals four. Uh, so just so you can kind of get a feel for this view, uh, I want to make it sound at least initially plausible to you. Um, so entertain the following question. If the entire space-time world we live in, whole universe, were to supernova and explode tomorrow, would it still be true that two plus two equals four? Okay. Now, a lot of people have thought, indeed, probably most think, yeah, that would still be true. Like blowing up a bunch of physical objects doesn't keep all of them even. Two plus two from equaling four. Okay. Um, so that's one sort of thought experiment you might run to make Platonism or the view that numbers are abstract objects, plausible, okay? Um, here's another way to think about this. Not only does two plus two equal four, you might think, and everyone does think this, necessarily two plus two equals four. So contrast that with, so here's four markers, there are four markers on this ledge. That's true, 
But it's not necessarily true. I could take one away, and now all of a sudden that there's four markers on this ledge is false. Now, Plato argued physical reality doesn't contain any necessary truths. Um, it happens to be a fact that rocks exist, but they could easily have not existed. Okay. It happens to be a fact that there are four markers on the chalkboard, but it could easily be a fact that there are only three. So mathematical truths, Plato thought, are different than physical truths. They're fixed, they're unchanging, eternal, if you will, uh, whereas physical reality, even Plato knew, is constantly in flux, constantly undergoing change. So it's the unchanging, necessary nature, nature of mathematical truths that caused Plato to think they were abstract objects, something beyond the realm of space and time. Okay, so that's called Platonism about math. Um, there's a couple problems with it, and they're considered devastating problems. So even though this view looks initially tempting, uh, one problem is uh, a problem with knowledge. So let's say this is true, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and this is some sort of radically transcendent truth grounded in numbers that exist beyond space and time. Okay. Perhaps the biggest objection to Platonism as we'd never be able to discover mathematical truths. Uh, so take the truth that there's a marker right here. Well, I can discover that because, for example, light waves bounce off it, they connect with my mind brain, and I represent the marker in that mind brain. And since it's caused, that image of the marker in my mind is caused in the right way by the marker, we can tell a little story about how I become aware of the marker. But if numbers are completely abstract objects, they don't exist in space and time, then there's no way I can come into contact with them. That raises a huge problem. Well, how can I know numbers are real and how can I know specific numerical facts if I can't encounter those facts, okay? Um, and then the other big objection to Platonism concerns the fact that math is the language of the natural sciences. <laughs> we express truths about physical reality using mathematical language. Uh, so just take, you know, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So the speed of light is represented numerically. Squaring it's a numerical relation. relation. Uh, the amount or the um, forcefulness of energy is going to be represented using numbers. Mass will be represented using numbers. But if numbers are here and physical reality is here, why? Why would this language be the best language to describe the physical world? So these are the two problems of Platonism that cause philosophers to seek alternatives to it. One second. Even though it has that initial plausibility uh, based on those two thought experiments. Um, yeah, mathematical truths are necessarily true. Um, the whole space-time world could blow up and it seems like two plus two is still four. So that initially supports Platonism, but then we have these two objections against it. Now, Penelope Maddy is a, a philosophy professor specializing in the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, she teaches at MIT, which is arguably the most prestigious uh, university in, in the country. Um, and she's going to offer us a theory of how we come to know about numbers. And the big mystery for Maddie is that, um, 
our knowledge of numbers far outstrips our knowledge of physical reality. Okay. Now let me illustrate that. So um, let's say you're counting. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Here's one thing we know. Let's just take, let's highlight one and two for a second. Between any two numbers is a third number. So between one and two is 1.5. Between one and 1 1.5 is point, uh, 0.75. Sorry, 1.25. That, that's a better answer there. Um, between 1.25 and 1.5, 1 1.375. 1 and we could do this forever. Okay, so the fancy way of saying this is numbers are infinitely dense. Between any two numbers is a third number, and they're infinitely packed in. Similarly, there's no highest number. No matter how long you count, you can always add another number. So that's another way of saying uh, the number series is infinite, just goes on forever. Now, obviously, we don't know these two truths through experiencing the world because no one's ever been able to and no one could sit down and map every number. Like you went one, two, three, four. You could just keep going, but you'd never arrive at the final number or the entire infinite collection of numbers. That's not something you would ever do. And yet we know that numbers go on forever, okay? Um, now, a Platonist might say, yeah, we somehow become intuitively aware that there's an infinite numbers of, number of numbers, and these are mind-independent objects. Um, of course, there's a lot of mystery there. How exactly would we become aware of that? So Maddie doesn't want to be a Platonist, uh, but she also wants to account for the fact uh, that our knowledge of numbers far outstrips uh, what we learn from experience. So that's her project, okay? So let me just explain. Okay, so let's look at question one. Question one says, um, in the first paragraph, Maddie notes that we discuss numbers as if they are a type of object. I highlight the as if, because this is not Maddie's own view. Yet numbers are not like ordinary physical objects, if they are objects at all. How are they described in the text as being different from ordinary objects? All right, so the basic idea here is, uh, here's a physical object, an ordinary object. I can weigh it. I can throw it up and down and catch it. I, could, I mean, I could if I wanted to. I could smell it. It has a color. Um, but numbers aren't like this. They're weightless, tasteless. Uh, they're just not the sort of thing one can physically encounter. They don't have physical properties. But they do have properties. Like the number four has the property of being even. The number one has the property of being odd. But these are different sorts of properties than physical objects have. Okay? Okay. Now... Question 1B. Oh, sorry, I just popped open the wrong set of... Okay, so question 1B says, when we encounter three chairs, do we encounter numbers or chairs? Um, and what Maddie's going for here is she's trying to discuss the origins of our numerical concepts, and she's showing they have a foothold in reality, even though in the end, we extrapolate beyond what we experience. So let's say there's these three chairs. All right, I encounter chairs, not numbers, but then I label this chair one, chair two, chair three. So our initial use of numbers as we see three things of the same type or two things or how many things, and we sort them 
and we sort them or count them using numbers. Chair one, chair two, chair three. Okay. Um, so this is important because it explains why numbers are relevant to physical reality. Our initial use of them is to label physical things. Now we do that as a mental operation. Okay, that's chair one, that's chair two, that's chair three. Um, so our first contact with numbers is we use them to sort objects. So we become aware of threeness. There we go, one, two, three chairs. Maddie's point is we don't have to, you know, encounter some sort of abstract object. Three, ah, yes, one second. Yes, I intellectually contacted the number three. It exists beyond space and time. Now I know what three is. That's not required, says Maddie. We just use numbers in a practical way. One, two, three, three chairs, and that's good. Okay. Um, question two says in the last paragraph on the bottom of page 486, uh, Maddie offers a paraphrase of what we mean when we claim that two plus two equals four. What is that paraphrase? Now, what Maddie's going to walk us through is a series of more abstract ways of thinking using numbers, but still having a pretty tight fit with the world of physical objects, okay? So initially, three chairs. These are chairs, not ages. One, two, three. I use numbers to count, okay? So now I've acquired the concept of a number, and I might think two plus one equals three, okay? And she says, well, what do I mean by that? Well, what we mean is anytime you have two of something and then another of that same thing when you put them together you have three total so there's already some abstracting going on i'm realizing i could do the same thing with three footballs as i can with three chairs like okay two footballs uh here's another one now i have three footballs so I'm realizing the specific physical objects do not matter. It's just the operation of grouping them together, whatever they are. So two plus one equals three means, in her paraphrase, if I have two of something, some sort of objects, and they don't even necessarily have to be objects. Uh, they could be thoughts or something like that, but let's just stick with objects. And then I add another one, I'm always gonna get three total. So again, there's, a, there's some distancing here from direct contact with physical reality. So initially, one, two, three, three chairs. Eventually, oh yeah, it doesn't have to be chairs. It could be two of anything, one more of that same thing, and that's gonna equal three. And then same question, talks about what is called the commutative property of addition. Uh, so once I really get a hold of what I mean by numbers, I realize that their numbers are what she calls commutative. And that means two plus one equals one plus two. Okay. And this is true for any pair of numbers you're adding together. A thousand plus five thousand equals five thousand plus one thousand. So there, again, we're just getting a little more abstract. So whenever I have two of something and one of something, oh, the commutative property. Well, I could flip the order. I could deal with the one first, then add the two, and then I'm gonna get the same answer. So we're obtaining the concept of number through the act of counting initially. And then once we have that concept, step two, we realize we can apply it to any physical objects. So that's a little more uh, abstract than the concrete operation of counting. 
And then I realize, you realize, we all realize, yeah, the order of the numbers are added doesn't matter. So that's even more theoretical. Um, so that's a move the mind can make once it's acquired the numeric concepts from things like counting. Then we can kind of play around with the concepts in our head and see they have all these interesting properties, such as the commutative property. Okay, now, let's see what she asked next. Um, all right, now, question three, which I'm not going to read out. The idea here is we're going to get even more abstract. Maddie points out, we know that for any number, there's a higher number. Now, I don't think many of you will do this, but if you ever take a class in mathematical logic, this is what the equation looks like. You don't have to memorize or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so mathematical logic, the upside down A followed by the X means for all X, and X is gonna range over numbers. So this says for every number, the backward E means um, sum. So for every number, there's some number such that that number, that some other number is greater than the first one, okay? Um, the fact that we can write this out as a logical equation means it's a, it's a necessary truth about numbers. So this is paraphrased as for every, that's the all part, number, there is some number, that's the sum, sum y part, such that that number y is greater than x, okay? And this is true for every number. That means you never get to a highest number. Now, the, again, the riddle here is, how can we know that? No one's ever experienced counting to infinity. No one ever will. It would take an infinite number of time to do it. We don't have an infinite number of time. So her solution is to point out that as a general rule, once we abstract, once we gain a concept from experience, even non-mathematical concepts, they have a, an enormous, potentially infinite uh, scope of use. So for example, let's say you're a kid, you're walking along with, I don't know, your dad or something, and you see this thing. This is a rabbit, by the way. We'll just leave it at that. I can't draw. So you see a rabbit and your dad points and says, hey, that's a rabbit. And then the next day you're walking along, you see a bunch of things that look like this running around. You apply rabbit to them as well. And then maybe you're imagining a furry little creature with big ears. And you're thinking, ah, oh, that's a rabbit too. Now you've only ever seen one rabbit. But once you've acquired the concept, you can apply that concept to a potentially infinite number of rabbits. So this is a common feature of the human mind. It's not unique to math. Um, but Maddie says, look, all right, but let's say something more specific here. How do we know there's an infinite number of numbers? And she says, well, at some stage of development, we represent numbers using numerals. So numerals are these written things that represent numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Can't see that very well. Let me try a different marker. So number one, okay, 100, 1,000, um, million, billion, and Maddie says, look, at some point you realize you can just keep adding numerals. So your mind brain thinks, 
Okay. I see no reason to stop ever adding numerals. So for any number I rep any number I represent using a numeral, I can represent a higher number. Um so think of the Platonist insights. Our knowledge of numbers is somehow beyond or going surpassing some sort of ground in physical reality. So I, I'm never, and you're never going to experience an infinite number of objects that you're going to label one, two, three, et cetera. But once you acquire your numerical concepts by doing that labeling, you can then ignore physical reality and just play around in your head with how you represent numbers using numerals. And you realize you could always add another zero or another one or something like that. And that, says Maddie, is how we acquire mathematical concepts. Uh, once we use the concept, we can then kind of ignore that physical example we got it from. And then our mind can just extrapolate wildly beyond what we've experienced. And this results in this idea that there's no highest number, the set of numbers is infinite, uh, things like that. Um, so numbers, on Maddie's view, turn out to be concepts. Um, they're concepts we form in our mind. Uh, we don't need to appeal to a kind of uh, entire non-physical and mind-independent reality which again would make numbers impossible to know about. Numbers are something we come up with. We use them to count. But then once we come up with them, they have their own logic. And we discover that logic when we start representing them using numerals. Um, and then we're off and running. All right, so that's the gist of Maddie's uh, view on how mathematical knowledge is possible. Uh, again, she's trying to account for the ways our knowledge of math goes beyond our experience of the physical world without resorting to this Platonist view that numbers are already out there and then we're somehow making intellectual contact with them. She's like, no, numbers are no different than these other concepts like rabbits. Um, we can come up with the concept and have it link up with experience in a certain way but then we can abstract from those experiences and kind of realize the inner logic, uh, maybe the unexpected inner logic of the, the concept we initially thought of. So that's the idea. All right. Um, saved arguably the hardest topic for last. Hopefully that was clear. And um, good news for you. I'm not going to put this on the final, um, but thought it'd be cool if you just kind of get one more last topic to chew on. All right. Thank you.